This is the best of first and last, the podcast with Mike Golick Jr. and Robin Lundberg. Galchenyuk puts on the brakes in the far corner. Now to the point to Markov. Eight seconds. Now Galchenyuk, left circle. Down low for Pacioretty with five. Pacioretty cuts to the near side. Three seconds. Sends off the side of the net. McDonough with the puck. Rangers win game four. That call courtesy of ESPN New York 98.7. Isn't one of the rules of being a producer that you're not supposed to make the show about yourself? Isn't that one of the things? You know what? I'm pretty sure that's in the handbook, but it became very clear to me when I walked in the door this morning that this was getting talked about on air. So producer guy Dan, for anyone that may not have heard, I don't think we brought it up yesterday, but ventured into the city last night to go watch the Rangers play and has a story about going into the press conference and chickening out on asking a question at the end and all that. So how are we feeling? You look exhausted right now. I'm very tired. You were worried about Elaine Vigneault? I mean, it was one thing if it was John Tortorella. You could ask Elaine Vigneault a question. It wasn't that. It's just I got the vibe that everyone in the room like knew each other, and I, I, I don't feel like I was supposed to be there. So I just didn't want to draw any more attention to myself, which I already was, so sitting in the front row. So you, you're just drawing attention to yourself here. You're making up for the attention you didn't want to draw to yourself last night by drawing it to yourself here. You could have at least played the Rangers' goal song, by the way, which is a banger, and in, instead you, you went with the you know the Yankees song, basically. He's just he's dumbfounded. And for <laughs> for those playing at home, producer Dan is a shell of himself right now. I walk into the studio this morning, and it's just head down on his desk. He is in physical pain. So he's he's playing through pain today. This is his flu game today. We're going to applaud his effort after the fact because I'm sure it'll still be top notch. But he's hurting right now. I There's just no needed question. I needed fifteen minutes and I got it. I'm good. We we got this. See, if this was a pro athlete, you wouldn't, you know, be accepting of any excuses. You would say you have to perform and it's your your fault. You chose to go to the Rangers game last night. Look, the job will get done. That was a that was a tight open. A great start. I think we're off to a roaring start. I mean, we talked about hockey for four minutes. This is awesome. That is true. It was a hell of a night in the NHL, too. There you go, hockey guy. Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. The Rangers win with producer Dan Z in the house 2-1 to over Montreal in the contest last night. Straight Talk Wireless nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable network. The contest. You're ridiculous. The Blue Jackets also stole one in the Penn Series. They won't go down without a fight. And... San Jose just laid it on kind of thick in Edmonton. That series is tied up 2-2, 7 nothing. Was it not a contest? I mean, it, it was a contest. It can be a game like everything else, Robin. Like we, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about the Celtics Bulls contest from last night. A conquest by the Bulls in that contest, and the context of that is very interesting. As we are looking at a one and an eight seed. I apologize, but it, it felt right at the time. Uh, the one seed of the Boston Celtics now down 0-2 against the Chicago Bulls. And really, that game wasn't much of a contest <laughs> last night. 111-97, Chicago dominating this series so far, Mike. And uh, they're, they're dominating in some ways that I guess we should have seen coming. You know, when whenever you're doing these series analysis, right, a couple of things come into play, and one of them is, is the styles make fights or, or the matchups kind of deal. So for Boston... They're very vulnerable on the glass, and that's been one of their, their problems all season long. You know, when you talk about specific matchups, for instance, Boston has played Golden State very well over the last several years. And if you're picking teams to maybe compete against Golden State, they may be one of your, your top five picks with their weaknesses included because they have the kind of personnel that can uh, guard a team that spreads you out. But... If you're talking about going up against a, a team that's rugged defensively and can hit you on the boards, that is going to undo Boston, as we've seen. And with the the Bulls, they've got rebounders who are their guards. You know, Wade rebounds, Rondo rebounds, Butler obviously rebounds. And then Robin Lopez has been a force in this series. And, and Robin Lopez never puts up gaudy individual rebounding statistics. But if you look at things like rebounding rate, when he is on the floor, his team always rebounds better, you know, because he does things to help other guys secure the ball, like you know, boxing out and stuff. Yeah, what a what a novel concept. But yeah, they got they got contributions across the board last night. 
Uh, we saw Michael Carter Williams even make an appearance, starting to tap into some of that young depth on that team. But you had two things really come to a head that most of, most of social media seemed enamored with, which was the emergence of you know Emma or of uh, I should say primetime Rondo or national TV Rondo and the TNT Bulls all coming into one and making the secret sauce that was a team that just looks flat out better than the one seed. These aren't fluky wins. These aren't things happening on accident. Like you said, whether it's the matchup, whatever you want to call it, at this point in time, we talked about peaking at the right time yesterday. The Bulls appear to be hitting their stride just in time and look like every bit of the better basketball team. Well, part of it is the matchup, and and Boston and uh, Chicago, it's a bad one for, for the Celtics. And the other part is the Celtics are a victim in a sense of their own success because they're not quite as good as their their record may look to be. I mean, they, they are, I, I always have a joke with the Celtics, they're their best player away, right? They still need their best player. And we always talk about how important the best player is in the NBA. They really only have one guy who can go out and get a shot, and, and that's Isaiah Thomas, who has to, you know, deal with overcoming not not only the, the terrible tragedy in his family, but just, you know, game in, game out, season in, season out, not being the, the biggest guy, uh, you know, there is. So even when he's on the court, defensively, you have some issues there. They're missing that, that guy, you know, I've mentioned Jimmy Butler and Paul George because they were in the, the, the trade rumors, that kind of guy on their roster. Well, and you, you saw it very apparent last night in certain stretches, especially towards the end of that game where his size – came a lot into play. We saw him getting towards the basket and just getting everything sent back at that point. Jimmy Butler on the other end continued to make freakishly athletic plays, continued to do things that made it even more pronounced when all of a sudden you start watching and you realize the Celtics best just really isn't going to be better than a whole lot of people's, especially in the matchup here. And especially when you're getting production from the three point line, like you got from Dwayne Wade three for four on last night after last season, going that stretch of what felt like six months where he couldn't buy one, where you had Rajon Rondo looking like he's back in those days where he looked like he was big three plus with that Boston Celtics championship team. Yeah, and uh, it's probably over, right? I mean, I, I would say it's probably over at this point. I saw a stat right before the show. Brad Stevens, this speaks to what I was just saying about the Celtics, now 2-10 and in the postseason. That's the worst record by any coach in playoff history with a minimum of 10 games. Now, 10 games is still a, a small sample size. He, he's 2-10 and overall. Uh, but that, that speaks to, I think, exactly what it is with the Celtics, where they, they play together. They have some some nice complimentary pieces, guys like Jay Crowder, guys like Avery Bradley. But when it gets to money time, they don't have those front of the roster guys. And when they're playing the the, the good teams, they're just not quite good enough, especially when the team that they're facing does things well that are their particular weaknesses. You know, how, you know who has as many playoff wins as Brad Stevens? Um, Fred Hoiberg. Ooh, sick burn, bro. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> you know, it leads to an interesting question, though, doesn't it? Because the NBA is the sport where people bemoan the lack of upsets. It's chalk reigns, go forward all the time. You can pencil in who's going to go forward. And this is a one and an eight. An eight is going to beat the one, almost certainly, I would say, at this point. Yet it doesn't feel like an upset. It's uh, kind of a head-scratcher. It's kind of a head-scratcher, I think, because we see the product on the court. It's not one of those where you understand it's a scrappy underdog going out there and finding a way to steal it night after night. But at the same time, this is, what, only the sixth time that an eight-seed will beat a one-seed if we take this out to the, the eventuality here. And I understand the point you've made, and we, as we talked about this, we don't think either of these teams was going to factor into the championship conversation for the season, but at the same time, we get excited for 10-7 matchups and upsets all the time in the NCAA tournament. We love those first day upsets, even though they pro- usually don't lead to anything of substance later on. Why can't we get excited here? Yeah, I-, I think since the playoffs expanded to 16 teams in 84, there's only been four eight seeds to beat a one. Now, this would be the, the least surprising, probably. Uh, the-, the Knicks beat the Heat in 1999 in the uh, lockout 
shortened season uh, when they went to the, the finals and, and lost to the Spurs. The Grizzlies a few years ago, I think, is the most recent one over the, the Spurs in, in the first round of the playoffs. And then the, the two most famous, I think, that stand out are the Nuggets over the Sonics because of Dikembe Mutombo lying on the floor with the, the ball above his head and uh, the Warriors over the Mavericks the year. The, the Mavericks won 67 games that year and, and B. Diddy, Baron Davis, and the Warriors took them out in the first round. Yeah, and so uh, with what the other relevant statistic in all of this then seems to be, if you're the Celtics fan trying to find hope, is that they're the second one seed to lose the first games of a series versus an eight seed. The only other team was the 1993 Suns that went down 0-2 and eventually made the NBA Finals. So if you're looking for history to be on your side, that's about your only hope. But they don't have Charles Barkley and Kevin Johnson on this team. First and last. The podcast. The Bulls get the win over the Celtics to take a two nothing series lead. Both of the wins coming in Boston. I'm asking you, does it count as an upset? It is an eight seed over a one seed. If the Bulls win this series, eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. Michael Riley tweets in: Wade has played more playoff games than the Celtics roster. Not an upset, and that's something that people will go to. If you're looking at the most famous players in this series, I would say that Chicago probably has the top three. Uh, you know, easily, I easily. You could argue, I guess, Isaiah has cracked that this year, perhaps. But otherwise, Jimmy Butler, Dwayne, w- Dwayne Wade would be number one. But Dwayne Wade, Jimmy Butler, and, and Rondo. I'd say Dwayne Wade and Jimmy Butler in the current landscape of the NBA, definitely. But Rajon Rondo's a former NBA champion. He was a guy that, for a while, had that really rising star that was always talked about. If he could add any semblance of a jump shot to his game, he was maybe going to be one of the next best and brightest. We obviously know his career has taken some interesting turns since then, even including this season. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's any stretch to say that you would name off those three guys before you would get to IT and anyone else the subject of the Celtics have to offer. He's Mike Golick, Jr. I'm Robin Lundberg here on ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance. You can save hundreds on your car, business, or recreational vehicle insurance from a local independent agent. Go to Progressive.com today. Now that's Progressive. Perhaps we're giving up on the Celtics, but Avery Bradley said last night that Rondo and company believe the Celtics have already given up. It was difficult. Our team, um, I looked looked around and a few times in the game. You know, guys were putting their heads down. And, um, I think getting down on ourselves. But as a team, we have to stay together. We have to. The other team is looking at that. You know, they're using that as motivation for themselves. And I could even hear Rondo like, "Yeah, they they gave up. They gave up." But we never can let a team see that. Um, we have to continue to be positive and um, go out there and play hard, no matter what the outcome is. No better feeling. There's no better feeling in sports either. So you're right. That's the last thing on earth you ever want to give somebody because you know on the other end, when you see it, when you see a guy break, and it's it's as clear as day. And you saw I mean, we could see it on the outside with the Celtics last night, so I couldn't imagine being on the court there. But when you look across with whoever you're going against and you just see, all right, that guy's done. The rest of my day is going to be a walk in the park because they just don't want it. They've spit the bit at that point. It's the sweetest nectar outside of a championship that sports has to offer. Let's go to Chris in Ohio. Chris, you're up first here on First and Last. Hey, good morning, guys. I just think that it's not an upset at all. I mean, if you have the Cavs, who could have been the number one seed, willing to seemingly give up home court advantage and lose out at the end so that way they can get the two seed and not have to play the Bulls, I mean, if the if the defending champions don't want to play you, it's not an upset. See, I don't think it has anything to do with the Cavs not wanting to play the Bulls. In fact, I think the Cavs would dispatch the Bulls easily. Uh, but I think um, – it had a lot more to do with the Cavs not caring that much about the number one seed because they don't value it that much. They weren't worried about Boston. That that It tells you that much. They're not worried about having to play Boston in an eventual Eastern Conference final, and that decision looking a lot better now. I mean, I, I don't think they were ever overly criticized for it, but it's looking even better now to not have gone all out to get that one seed when the one seed is likely to lose, so you then become the de facto one seed. Exactly. It's worked out pretty well for him. We knew LeBron James' record as a two seed in the Eastern Conference anyway. Five five times he's been a two seed. Five times they've been in the NBA Finals in that vein, but Listen, maybe there's a little bit of insider trading here, too. He's got his good buddy, his banana boat buddy, Dwayne Wade, on the other end. Calls him up, Dwayne Wade's like, listen, I got a hot tip for you. It's been a rough year, but things are on the up right now. We're hitting our stride. I'm feeling really good about this group and my jumper's back. So 
you're going to want to, you know, I'm not saying lose, but I'm saying maybe just don't win and we'll see you later on. Here's the problem with that. Did they also get on the phone with Sean Marks of the Brooklyn Nets? Remember, the, the, the end of the season we did have, the, it came down to the last game, whether it was going to be Miami or Chicago or, you know, perhaps Indiana falling out of that mix in, in that game. So uh, the 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 much uh, ballyhooed decision to sit Brooke Lopez and Jeremy Lin and all that played into it too. Listen, I'm sure they've got connections all over the place. It's a very tangled web, and these guys are the power players. These are the guys pulling the strings. In the NBA, Rob, and I ask you to just stay a little bit woke. I know it's early. You know, the Banana Boat crew, man, uh, I don't know you know, how they're going to work out vacations going forward. They're in a little bit of troubles. Man, did you see the memes going around last night, the picture of LeBron and his wife sitting there in the, uh, yeah. sitting there in the room? I-, I understand it's someone's personal situation, but good Lord, the Internet remains undefeated and being hilarious. I mean, you, the, the jokes are, are, are flying, and you, you sort of feel bad. Um, but you know, it, it's hard. Did you see that New York post was la, 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 Hey, 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 goodbye. Like Nick's wife wants mellow gone. Uh, she wants, you know, ISO mellow, uh, I guess. I, I, I tell you the New York post wasting no time. There's a, there's no shocker there with that sort of, uh, headline ready and waiting in the wings. I'm sure they've had that one on file for a while. Let's go to Mark in state college, Pennsylvania. Mark, you're up next on the show. Go ahead. Gentlemen. Yeah, Mike Robin, good. good to hear from you. First time, long time. Uh, two things for you. Number one, this is an absolute upset. You have the best team in the East just getting absolutely worked by an eight seed. All right? Number two, does Boston finally pull the trigger and break this team down and bring in somebody who can put them over the top? Just wanted to hear your reactions. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, Boston's still in a strong position going forward because they do have that, that Nets draft pick, um, which was a hot commodity. The, the question, I think, looking backwards is, did they have a chance? And I don't know. But did they actually have a chance to nab Jimmy Butler or Paul George in a trade? Because that's the exact kind of player they need. And it might have been enough to, quite frankly, put them over the top this year, considering Cleveland's struggles. Yeah, did they wait too long to sell off what they had? Because now Paul George, most people talk about that as a certainty that he's going to end up either in Los Angeles or depending on the media voting, staying in Indiana and uh, you know taking in some of that, what, $70 million he's eligible to get if he is an, NBA, an all-NBA teamer? So uh, that's one of the questions. But either way, they do have you know some good young players on that team, and they, they do have that draft pick. And despite his playoff record, they do have a really good young coach as well. First and last. The Raptors and the Clippers, they even both of those series and were brought to you by Upside. Now save big on travel and get a big gift card every trip you buy. You'll love Upside.com, Upside.com. Let's uh, handle these in, in order of appearance. One was Toronto over Milwaukee the first game. Milwaukee has been game in, in this series, obviously winning game one, and, and they were in last night's game, Mike. You know how I feel. I think um, the, the Raptors have the best overall rotation in, in the Eastern Conference, obviously not the best players, which, which is the, the, the difference between them and Cleveland in my mind. Um, but they, they dropped game one, and, and last night's game was a close one. But nevertheless, the struggles of DeRozan and Lowry in the postseason – did not carry over last night as both of those guys got going, and that was probably the difference. Yeah, and Kyle Lowry stepping up in the big moment there at the end, sinking the shot that put them up two, uh, two possessions and ultimately sealed the game. But you're right, for most of that game, it continued to be what's been a big coming out party so far for Giannis Antetokounmpo and what he's been able to do. The amount of stop and stop and sort of stand up and stare in awe plays that that guy continues to make as a young player who it almost at times reminds you of like a, like a baby giraffe, a guy who's so good and so talented and has all these physical traits and is maybe still learning like even how to translate it all into being this top level basketball player. I mean, for a guy that led his, you know, was the sixth guy ever or whatever to lead his team in, in, in all those five categories that we've talked about, you can still see so much room for him to get better that it's a terrifying thought. Now, I agree with everything you said. I, I just, um, a little curious, giraffe. Why giraffe? Because he's, he's got the long limbs, oh. you know, and that baby giraffes are born. They're born huge. You know, they have to fall such a big distance, so they give them the long legs to account for the fall. But he's got all those long appendages, and he's he, he's he's tall okay. and moves well, but, you know. Like, the 
Okay, appearance. The visual. Because uh, I was going to say, like, I don't think of, like, the full-grown, mature giraffe as something to be really be reckoned with. It's just sort oh, of like man. an animal that walks around. Go- Google giraffe fights and then get back to me, all right? Giraffes are not to be trifled with. Well, if you're power ranking the animal kingdom, though, the, the giraffe doesn't really come to mind. I would say that Giannis um, is much higher than a giraffe in the hierarchy of, of animals. I saw a giraffe beat the hell out of a lion on YouTube one time. So fall back and give giraffes the respect they deserve. If Giannis was a giraffe, giraffes can still be pretty bad you-know-whats in their own right. Have you guys seen the video of the dogs in the backyard chasing a bear? No. no. Oh, please go look that up. There's like... It's one of those awesome internet videos where you don't see it coming. Like, the dogs are just kind of running around. You're like, oh, what's going on? Is there, like, a snake back there? And there's, a like, a brown bear in their backyard, and these dogs chase this thing over a fence. It's awesome. Animals are fearless, man. They get that sort of that instinct that kicks in, and they just go. And dogs, I mean, they're the relatives of pack animals from the bygone era. They're evolved from wolves and other group hunters. So that's not a, sh- a shock. I've seen a house cat send a, a alligator going the other way that one that one's a little shocking as someone who grew up with a cat in the state of florida you kind of knew that if you let kitty outside things weren't going to end too well uh, you know my thing on cats though you don't mess with cat on cat on even weight taking everything out all right let's go to the next game somehow we'll, we'll get to that um not on even weight are the clippers and the jazz because rudy gobert has been out for the the utah jazz they overcame that in game one. But a lot of times, Mike, that's something you can do in that short span because it's like a let's rally in this moment. And the longer you go for, the more it becomes apparent, hey, we don't have our best player. Yeah, over over a long enough time. But you're right. Anyone who's played sports for any extended amount of time has suffered an injury to a marquee player that you absorb, especially when it is early on like that because you've got time to... I wouldn't say processes. It's almost different if you were to lose him late in the game where it was close and he had been an integral part where all of a sudden, oh, my God, you've got this jarring uh, shock to your lineup. You lose him at the beginning of the game. You say, all right, we've got to, we've got to absorb and do this, and you can. But uh, you're right. The Clippers going back out last night and turning the bear back around the, on the dogs here and being the team that we've all hoped they could be all along. It's not a coincidence old man Paul Pierce is driving to the cup last night a, a couple times, and that Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan both put up big offensive games. You know, Chris Paul, his playoff career not getting to the Western Conference Finals or, or further uh, dogs him. I, I think Chris Paul is just a fantastic player. But you're looking at the rest of that roster. The other guy last night, DeAndre Jordan, he was dunking all over the place. And that guy, to me, you know, this was a matchup of, if you're talking full-time centers, because the way the, the game's played now, Anthony Davis shifts over to center, so on and so forth. A lot of these guys who are new school players, Giannis might be able to play minutes at center going forward, right? But when you're talking full-time, traditional kind of centers, the two best in the league are Gobert and DeAndre Jordan. And people sleep on the value that that a guy like Jordan brings to the table, not only as a a screener and a rebounder and a defender, but how he can open up the floor as a rim diver. Because, yeah, I know where most of his field goal attempts come from, but there's something to never missing a shot ever and being an automatic bucket. Like, if the attention is not paid to you, you're an automatic two points. And you saw that last night without Gobert around. Jordan, especially early in that game, was just dunking everything, grabbing everything, putting it right back, and, and, and dunking it again. Man, it's a one thing, yeah, where the buckets come from. You still got to get there every time. Like, people love using that argument against Shaq. He was still able to get there every time. If people can't stop you, if, if it was that easy, everyone would be doing it like that all the time. So uh, I don't want to downgrade it too, too much, but... Yeah, listen, they went out there, and this is a team that's sort of playing for its life, like has to kind of smell its mortality as a collective unit at this point, and that'll do funny things to you. Here was DeAndre Jordan on what happened between Game 1 and Game 2. Doc yelled at us a lot. With good reason? Yeah, we played like, we didn't play good um, <laughs> Game 1, and um, that's why we, you know, that's why we were down a game, and uh, tonight we... The past two days, we've gone over a lot of things, um, things that we didn't see as, as players in, in game one, and we corrected and tried to take advantage of tonight. And uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be more adjustments in game three, and we just got to come out and, and figure it out and adapt and adjust. You know, and if you look at the regular season, Mike, 
the Jazz played like a 56-win team with Rudy Gobert on the floor and a 34-win team with him off the floor. So uh, if he doesn't get back in this series, the, the Clippers are moving on. have to imagine that factored somewhere into the Doc Rivers yelling that happened is they're not, they don't even have their best player, and you guys went out and got washed by them the other night. For everything we always talk about, especially in pro sports, about how they're professionals and coaches and players are on a little more of an even playing field and uh, having a veteran group of guys you understand, sometimes there's no real substitute for just getting you, having someone get in your face and rattle you a little bit. Like I, I remember we won our opening game my last year at Notre Dame, beat the absolute snot out of Navy over in Ireland, and thought we played great, came back, and my offensive line coach lit us up like a Christmas tree in our room, and we walked out of there shell-shocked, like, oh my God, this was in a win. What's going to happen if we lose? But it makes you go back out and kind of relook at everything and fine-tune a lot of those smaller details that maybe you overlook in certain moments, especially this late in the season for these guys. And it, clearly it was enough of a wake-up call for them to go out and really play a game last night where I don't think their victory was ever all that in question. First and last. Swing and a miss and a ball in the dirt. Weeders picks it up. He steps on home plate. And the game is over. Kelly strikes out Darno to end the game and to strand the bases loaded. And now, I don't know if the umpires are going to talk. Phillips contending that the ball was tipped. And now they're calling everybody back out. Phillips was the only one contesting it. The Braves had already left the field. And if he, he missed that by a foot and a half. I mean, I just saw a replay. He missed it by a foot and a half. It was not even close. That's a horrible job by the umpires. So here we go again. Kelly has to strike him out again. One ball, two strikes. He comes set to pitch. Swing and a miss. Struck him out on a slider. And Weeders catches it in the air and turns around and looks at C.B. Buckner as if to say, is that good enough? What a joke. An absolute joke. They were angry. The call on the Nationals radio network had to go do it again. They won the game, though, so it's no big deal, right? Yeah, it's just annoying, though. You, you click out of that mode, you're ready to go home, and, oh, by the way, you're right by a foot and a half, but you're somehow forced to go back out there and go through the exercise again. I can see it. They're not mad online. They're mad in real life. Well, you know, um, this is further argument for people always talk about what you would do to baseball, and there, there's little cosmetic changes, and then there's radical ones. I honestly believe umpiring in baseball should be automated. I don't see any reason why not. The technology exists. I mean, I, I sit there and watch the baseball playoff games, and they got the, the, the box up there. They're showing me the strike zone. Have that thing call the balls and strikes. I'm sure there's some sort of sensor that can tell whether the, the ball moved to indicate whether or not there was a, a contact with the bat, right? Um, there, there's um, some sort of sensor that could tell whether the bat went too far forward to actually consider um, a, a strike rather than a check swing. So all that stuff can be done, and you save yourself stupid arguments. You, you save yourself, you know, messed up calls like that. Maybe you have a couple of guys spotting things out at that third base and first. But however, not, not saying you take the human element completely out, but behind the plate, balls and strikes. To me, it's much more efficient, much more accurate, and there's no reason that umpiring shouldn't be automated. You're ruining all the pageantry and the beauty of baseball. I can't watch two men scream at each other, kick dirt at each other, and eventually have one toss the other one out of the club. Why am I even bothering to watch baseball? See, uh, well, I, I go the other way. Like, a lot of that stuff is, is not, you know, is a reason for me to mock baseball, not not want to watch it. Um like the the old man manager coming out in in a baseball costume and, and putting his hands on his hips and spitting from his mouth uh, toward an umpire for an argument that's going to go nowhere that's only wasting time and that is slowing the pace of the play. Well, I mean, you could say that about every technical that's assessed for a coach or a player in any other sport, like the NBA, where we see it especially where coaches feel compelled to go out there and argue for a call because. But the coach isn't coming from down the block. Basically, in this, you know, they're coming from the, they're walking up the stairs. Steps, they're coming over. Well, listen, it's adjusted for the pace of the game in question. In <laughs> basketball, the pace is moving up and down a little closer. The coaches have a little easier access. They go right to it. Baseball, we know, I mean, when they call for a pitcher, he's got to come from all the way out from the bullpen, etc. So why wouldn't the coach have to do that work? He's wearing the uniform already. He should be subject to that same amount of physical effort to get there and argue his point. And why aren't they texting the bullpen at this point? You would think they'd be texting the bullpen. They really have a cord phone? You know, like, come on. Let's, let's be real now, guys. 
man, you are really trying to incite the machine revolution, and you're ready to start it in America's pastime. I don't know how I feel about this. Isn't the telephone a machine? I mean, at one point, somebody probably said the, the telephone was the machine It's a revolution. machine that we can control, Robin, and you're uh-huh. ready to cede control to the robots. How angry would you be if I called you, like, during the, the day? There's nothing worse than someone calling you. Come on. I mean, the few times and the few times I do get calls, I automatically assume the news is grave in nature. <laughs> There's no worse text to get than "Hey, call me when you get yeah. a minute," because I just start racking my brain for okay, what did I possibly do wrong to this person that's going to wind up making this go poorly for me? ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance, comparing rates to help you save. Now that's Progressive. Call or click today and find out how much Progressive could save you. Maybe Rob Manfred texted. Pittsburgh Pirates outfielder Starling Marte to say, hey, call me when you get a chance later, because he was hit with an 80-game suspension by Major League Baseball. I I said before the break, there are two um, baseball stories we're going to get into. One familiar, that's this. The other, very rare, which is coming up in a little bit. The PED thing in baseball is interesting, because it's almost like nobody cares anymore. It's no longer this um, huge, overarching problem that's destroying the sport, as it was treated before. Um, and it is less frequent. I, I mean, I guess they have done a better job. It just does feel like whenever there's one of these big time suspensions, it, it's kind of a passing mention. I don't know. I st- I think it's more of a product of who rather than what. Like if we mm-hmm. were talking about some of the big stars, like if Mike Stanton or Mike Trout or Bryce Harper or one of the big. St- I know you. Isn't that a short list? Well, no, it, honestly, though, it, it is a short list. But I mean, it was a short list when we cared about it being, you know, Bonds or Sosa or you know, the names that we bring up are the marquee names on a very short list from the time period where steroids were as more rampant than they are now. So I think if it was the stars that were called into question, and there's also something to the way it looks. I mean, at this point, we don't have guys that are basically like the Incredible Hulk out there, but even if they do, most of their counterparts, just because of the way exercise science and nutrition and everything else have caught up in the world of sports, you've got guys that are built like that a little more often, and let's just be real, most of the science behind you know steroids and performance-enhancing drugs is always going to far outpace what they can do testing-wise. Yeah, I, I think I agree Um Though, in the sense now that you articulated it, because, yes, uh, the, the cheating seems to outpace the testing. But we have gotten to a point where I feel like most people are assuming the best players are not cheating when the other way was the the way for a long time. And it was true. It was Bonds and A-Rod and so on and so forth. Basically, all the best players. Yeah, all the were, best were players. And we you know, used to assume that most off, more often than not, it was fringe guys that would be doing steroids. The guys that it was the difference between them drawing that major league or that NFL or that what, whatever league it was paycheck or being out on the streets, not the best guys the way it was for so long. I mean, listen, I'm not much of a baseball guy, but Starling Marte is a name that I didn't anticipate hearing until he was handed an 80-burger out here for getting caught with PEDs, and I won't hear about or care about his name again until he comes back from that suspension. So baseball's not going to miss him in that regard the way it would one of its marquee stars, where all of a sudden, when it's one of your stars, when it's one of the people you're trying to build the league on, all of a sudden that cracks the foundation a little bit. It undermines what you've got going on. He tested positive for Nandrolone, by the way. Um, it was one of these situations where afterwards he apologized, but seems to indicate uh, that he did not know. Uh, or, you know, he says, neglect and lack of knowledge have led me to this mistake, which is the, the familiar refrain nowadays. Yeah, the, the stock answer for anyone that's caught in this is, oh, I was taking a, norm- a substance that was perfectly legal, but I had no idea that this was one of the ingredients in it, which... Every single time you get people that stand up, whether it's the sports nutrition person, whoever you've got in charge of it in your given organization or team, the first thing they'll tell you is that ignorance is not an excuse, and yet that's the first excuse that people run to. You know what, though? Also talking about this, as as we're, we are discussing it, I'm thinking a little bit more, I'm not even so sure it was the star players as much as the record. Uh, I think it was the the, the hallowed oh, baseball a, record. That's a huge part of it because that's why no one cares in the NFL when anyone tests positive for PEDs, unless it, it was a quarterback. The way it got you know it got lobbed at uh, at some people over that time. But yeah, you're absolutely right because Bartolo Colon is celebrated and, and lauded, right? And he was a PED guy at one point. And uh, most famously, I can bring up is is Ryan Braun. Ryan Braun. It was one of the most egregious examples I can possibly think of. He totally threw somebody under the bus. He said, may lightning strike me dead if I cheated. And then it was found out later, 
he cheated, and he was a great player, MVP kind of candidate, but he was never near threatening any of those records, and nobody cares. Nobody cares that that happened, and basically everyone forgets that that happened. Well, yeah, base, baseball, almost more so than any other sport, is driven by the numbers, the records, the, the history of those things. That's why you'll get people that won't recognize Barry Bonds as the home run king and won't do all these things because it's treated as sacred ground. I mean, that's why you have people in the stands scoring the game themselves. That's the that's the <laughs> wired mentality of this fan base. You know, whenever I see that, I, I kind of um, laugh, especially with modern technology. Like, Apologies to anyone who sat there and scored the game with their dad or something, and, and that's like the way you, you, you know, take yourself back to that part of your life or remember him or, or something like that. But the, the guy who's scoring it when you could just, like, look it up, hey, uh, uh, you know, w- what are you accomplishing by scoring the game actually live in, in person? Man, you were just... You and baseball nostalgia today, just butting heads. The hot baseball take. JBT, our resident baseball guy, is over here just shaking his head on the board. At Seriously, you. though, why? Why would you do that? I Someone- enjoy it. I, I don't know why. I can't really give you a full explanation, but every time I go to a baseball game in person, I'm scoring it. I guess it gives you something to do because nobody can like intently watch the game the entire time. That's I mean, physically impossible. Yeah, and between beer and hot dogs, there's got to be some other outlet. First. And last, the podcast. Apparently they gave out 1,908 rings and pins to everyone from high-level executives to the scoreboard operator, which is too tidy, right? That's just a little bit too tidy. Like, who's the 1,909th guy who didn't get it? You know, like, scoreboard operator Gary got one, but scoreboard operator Jerome didn't. I, yeah, I, was, I think of, like, the movies whenever you see the credits and you see, like, grip, key grip, key grip number two. <laughs> like, what, did key grip number three lose out on this ring or pin all of a sudden? Just get left on the outside looking in? That poor guy. Come on, guys. You gave it to this dude. I mean, you, yeah. you gave it to the he's only here once a week um well sorry that has 1908 you're, you're 1909 yeah. can't, can't mess it up it was one of those things as i was going down and reading through the dot com article i get through and i loudly proclaimed to you guys i was like it gave out 1908 and then i stopped and audibly went oh <laughs> which is a lot to give out um and as a result they are trying to i guess um ensure themselves that none of this merchandise that they gave out or whatever you call it. I guess it's not necessarily merchandise. But none of these rings get sold off uh, and are used for profit because they are keepsakes and and valuable um, recollections of the the World Series that the Cubs just won. And therefore, the Cubs are asking non-players to sign an agreement giving the team the right to buy back the ring for $1. Now... The one defense I'll give of them for this is they are apparently paying the taxes on these rings for low-level employees who, you know, the the tax would be a burden on them. But that's about the only defense I can muster up because, sorry, once you give me that, it is now my property, right? And therefore, it is mine to do with as I please. It it, it is. And so the, the Cubs also said if the Cubs do elect not to purchase the ring, then you can transfer it according to the terms you provide. But I'd imagine that's a pretty big if. But you're right on the surface. It sort of seems ridiculous that, oh, we paid these taxes one time for you, so you should be limited in what you want to do going forward. When if any of these players, and it says that, you know there's tiers of rings as far as the value of these, but according to sports ring dealer Tim Robbins, if a mid-level player were to first sell his 2016 ring, it could go for at least eighty grand. So if you're telling me one of these players wanted to sell the ring down the line, they'd be able to. But someone making thirty or forty grand a year working in that stadium would be prohibited. Seems insane. Yeah, and you know what? You're not paying taxes on something you don't have anymore, right? So, um, that's a year salary, right? Let's just put it in that way. Let's just say it's a year salary for somebody here who could put a down payment down on a house that they couldn't afford, could get themselves out of debt that they were unable to do before. Like, that's a huge life-changing thing because what are you really doing? You know, I, I get some people are super fans, and I understand, so they'll be like, oh, you, how could you possibly ever get rid of it? But you're not a player on the team. You didn't do anything to win this ring. Why would this ring mean that much to you when that, that money would probably mean a lot more? And, and I think, listen, shoe on the other foot with that one, I do think – 
especially for people in that area, if you're working in the Cubs organization, I have to imagine that for a lot of people, especially if they're from around there, this did mean something to them still. And so their first thought wouldn't be to sell the ring. But like anything else, life comes at you fast at certain times, and you can't account for those things. And all of a sudden, when you're not in control of something that is supposedly your personal property now is a gift, and that's taken away from you. Now, we're, we're hearing about this because it's the Cubs and because it's a big deal. So I'd imagine it doesn't happen all that often. Often, but I'd be interested if this is something that's more of a common practice than we're giving it credit for. Because if it's not, this seems like it, bad PR in one sense. I mean, you've got you know the GM, Jed York, coming out and saying, well, I signed that thing willingly. I bet you did, Jed. <laughs> like, I bet you did. You know, I'm not a um, money guy. Like, I'm not I value money over other things. There, there are so many things in life more important than money and money is not the the number one goal i have even pre, you know professionally it's not i wouldn't say it's the number one goal of course everybody wants to be paid their their fair market value but I, i'm not that guy like i'm not that guy always in pursuit of the the constant buck or or the the, the next way to to cash in uh, at the same time these are people that in a different walk of life again as you mentioned and they aren't intimately necessarily attached to the, the specific team. And the reason I think, Mike, that this is signed for them is these Cubs rings theoretically would be rarer, right? Even if there are more of them, uh, so I guess more valuable is a better way to put it. Um, even if there are more of them, and, and there's a, a piece in the article that says that the, the family was very generous in how many that they gave out, but it's a Cubs World Series ring. It's not, um, you know, the, the Rays you know, World Series ring or Diamondbacks World Series ring or something like that. So it, it resonates more and it has a lot more value. So I, I guess that's the reason we're hearing about it, even if it's a more common practice. And I bet you it's not quite as much a, a common practice. I'm still blown away that this is differentiated the way it is, that non-players are the only one subject to this. Because if you're operating off that, there'd be nothing that would, I would say, diminish the value more than the ring of a player hitting the open market, especially if they're tiered the way they supposedly are. You know, why would why would one of those guys, especially if you're the Cubs, why wouldn't that be the ring you'd want to buy back? You know, if Anthony Rizzo later on in life for some reason felt the need to sell off his ring and Start the Cubs could buy Pete Rose or something, yeah, yeah, and the Cubs could buy that back for a dollar and all of a sudden have that to display somewhere on their property, somewhere in a, in a place where Cubs memorabilia would be, it would be the mo. I, I that seems like a really strange line to draw on the sand and an yeah, unfair one. I get the sentiment, but it, it really just comes down to once it's yours, it, it's yours, right? And therefore, um, if you want to have it as a keepsake and put it on a necklace, uh, that that's what you can do with it. And if you want to take it to the pawn shop and, and sell it, that's what you could do with it. If you want to give it to Eli Manning and then have him swap it out with one that could pass as a, a Cubs uh, World Series ring and sell it to a memorabilia dealer, you can do that too. Let's go to Trucker Rob. You're up next here on First and Last. Go ahead, Trucker Rob. Yeah, how you doing, fellas? How you doing, Mike? How you doing, Robin? Love You're good, show. man. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just making it to a comment. I'm keeping it in Chicago. Uh, I can't believe that the Chicago Bulls even made it to the playoffs. Was on vacation, and they're in the playoffs, and they they're beating the, uh, the Celtics, which I which I do not like. I wish the Knicks were there, but they're not. <laughs> as, as far as my second comment, I was thinking, as far as uh, the Cubs, what do you guys think about? Uh, Indian give us control free as far as the ring situation. That's my. I just want to know your guys' opinion about that. Yeah, we. I think we've both stated that we think it's it's sort of ridiculous. Now, I understand that they're paying taxes on the rings. Would there? I, I can't imagine there'd be anything within that logistically that would prevent someone from selling it after the fact if you're doing it as a courtesy to the people working underneath you. It shouldn't be something that binds you for any reason the other way. I'm not intimately familiar with tax law, even though it is tax season right now. Shout out to my you know, return and everything like that. But I, I don't think that should be something that binds it the other way, the way the Cubs are trying to put in writing now. It's tax season. It's also spring, Mike. Oh. And uh, nothing makes a spring birthday more magical than 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, when you order a dozen multicolored roses for only twenty nine ninety nine, you'll get another dozen plus a vase absolutely free. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. We should start, like, um, rating the uh, segues 
or the the you know the transitions into to billboards and the like. You know, producer Dan Z, who's tired this morning from going to the Rangers game last night. We should start you know on a one to ten scale doing that. I was going to say, Dan, at this point, Dan Z would start rating them in like hieroglyphs or letters or something like that. Nothing really makes sense to him in the world Wait, right now. I thought I, I give you guys billboards and stuff planned out perfectly. I gave you a perfect transition. Uh, you're welcome. You're giving yourself credit. Absolutely. Uh-huh. You know what? It's, a, it's only right, considering we started off the show talking about producer guy Dan, that he would find some way to work himself back as the central focus. Thank you for listening to the first and last podcast. You can listen and subscribe to all ESPN podcasts in the listen tab of the ESPN app. First and last.